Blessed day, everyone. Raza. And as part of the journey to neocolonialism, I am here to discuss Filipino diaspora in the light of Louis Althusser's concept of ideology with its authors, our very own Sir Rod, Rodrigo D. Abenes, and Eliza Louise V. Maliberan. Explores the phenomenon of Filipino diaspora in the light of Althusser's ideology. Overseas Filipino workers were considered as bagong bayani or the new heroes of contemporary Philippines because of their great contribution not only to the Philippines but to its host and receiving countries as well. With regards to the Philippines, OFW had been the saving grace of Philippine economic bankruptcy because of their enormous benefits through their remittances. However, Looking on the gravy perky of being one of the leading labor exporters in the world, the Philippines is facing a great dilemma. In the midst of the ongoing boosting of Filipinos preferring to work abroad is the dire situation in which not all of the OFWs who work abroad are in lively state. Some returned as casualty and traumatized version of themselves or, even worse, as dead-bodied bodies. Or, diba, we cannot even deny Paul that Filipino overseas workers are exposed to the exploitation of forced labor or even physical and sexual abuse. And despite all of that, the Philippine government continues to encourage the export of labor and assist aspiring Filipinos to work abroad. Despite the fact that they are being exposed to victimization, OFWs choose to work abroad because of the ruling ideologies that had been falsely perpetuated by its legitimizing government policies and correspondence principle through its hidden educational curriculum. In doing so, the researchers would like to explore the root cause of this phenomenon through looking at Filipino diaspora from the lenses of officers' ideology, guided by the following points. First, Althusser's ideological state apparatuses, second, discourse on the emerging Filipino diaspora, and third, Filipino diaspora in the light of Althusser's ideological state apparatuses. To continue, as the most influential Marxist philosopher of the 20th century, in his essay Ideology and Ideological State Apparatuses, Althusser argues for a materialist understanding of ideology. Rather than considering, considering ideology as mistaken ideas about the world, for him, ideology is essentially practical. Ideology does not exist in the world of ideas, conceived as a spiritual world, in that ideology exists in institutions and the practices is specific to them. More precisely, exist in apparatuses and the practices specific to them. He even delineates a number of these apparatuses, most prominently the church, the school, the trade unions, and family. He further insists that have a material existence, that ideology always manifests itself through actions which are inserted into practices. For example, we have the rituals, the conventional behavior, and so on. Althusser is also known for his revisions and interventions of the Marcus theory. To explain it further, it is imperative to first discuss classical Marxist societal Theory. So this representation of the social setup is divided between the infrastructure and the superstructure. The infrastructure refers to the economic base of the society which also composed of the means of production and the relation of production, while uh, the superstructure refers to the ideological elements of the society like state, 
law, philosophy, literature, religion, and culture. Figure 1 with the visual representation of the classical Marxist social structure he maintained the reciprocal relationship between the two variables of the prevailing social structure. The principle is that whoever controls the means of production, or the resources in which goods can be produced, including the raw materials, technology, the human resource, also controls the superstructure in the ideologies that it upholds. But despite certain dependency, the superstructure displays relative autonomy. Althusser extended his writings to the relationship between the infrastructure and superstructure by introducing two things. One, the reproduction of the productive forces, and two, the concept of ideological state apparatuses. Here are in order for a society to continue to exist in its distinguished dominant economic form, there is a necessity for the reproduction of its infrastructure, which is the means of relation, which is rather the means and the relation of reproduction. And this functions in two ways. First, the reproduction of different skills, which later give birth to the second, the ruling ideology. What will happen is that with the first function, productive forces, including the working class, then we have to be reproduced until there, there is an infinity of reproduction of reproductive force that operates in the society. This reproduction of productive forces go on to the tendencies for subjection to the oppressive ideology of practice, I should say having the dominant mode of production through which the know-hows as the middle class or the bourgeoisie play their roles as privileged over the working class who play their roles as the oppressed, confirming to the roles that the society set for them through the hidden curriculum of capitalist education and other ideological institutions. Number two which is the concept of ideological state apparatuses. Here, Althusser maintained the Marxist point of view that these ideological apparatuses can properly be described as belonging to the state even if they appear formally separate from it. He argues that the state actually has two components. A repressive state apparatus, or the RSA, the army, the legal system, the police force, prisons, the courts, and above them all, the government and administration. These bodies essentially function to serve the ruling classes. And the ideological state apparatus, or the ISA, with, with it having the most dominant, the educational system. Ideological state apparatuses or the educational, the school, the communication, the media, the religious, which is the church, the cultural, literature, arts, and sports, the family, the legal and political system, which is the political system or parties, and the trade unions. In these institutions, through injecting ruling class ideologies into the minds of the subjects, play their roles, present to them, which ultimately reproduce the so-called relations of production. In addition, he discussed and proposed four theses about ideology, that ideology represents the imaginary relationship of individuals to so their real conditions of existence. Then ideology has a material existence, that all ideology helps or interpolates concrete individuals as concrete subjects and already subjects.
In this part, we have visual representation of authoritarian social structure. Part of it is the ideological state apparatus, of course, the repressive state apparatus, means of reproduction, means of production, rather, and relations of production. Representation of the classical Marxist social structure and that of the authoritarian, we have these two figures. So the superstructure, law and state and ideologies, well, that of Arthasarian, we have the ideological SA and the repressive SA. So in this section, we'll be having the second key point that is so the movement of Filipinos as they search for better financial stability is the beginning of the phenomenon of Filipino diaspora. And diaspora is defined as a group of people with a migrant origin that still uphold sentimental or physical connection with their homeland. In this effect, overseas Filipino workers are considered as the subjects of Filipino diaspora as they live and work overseas for their inherent Filipino culture and habits, families, physical ownerships, economic responsibilities, which are all tied to their homeland. At present, Filipino diaspora is the prime mover of Philippine productive forces. This cannot be denied for it has been the saving grace, like I've said earlier, of the country's bankrupt economy in the last two to three decades. How did OFW emerge as such? It has its remote origins from the neocolonialism. So, in the Philippines, this can be manifested from the transnationalization of our economy when U.S. imperialism endowed our independence on July 4, 1946. Few days before our independence, the Bell Trade Agreement had made in exchange for the said paradoxical freedom and this golden chain was sealed because of economic domination. With this, Philippines' means of production was not anymore attached to land but attached to capital. Hence, it assured low wages of Filipinos and maintained cheap prices of export raw materials like sugar, copra, tobacco, abaca, and other mineral products. The colonists assured consumers of their imported finished merchandise. Herewith, the Philippines, as a newly formed nation, hinged on democratic and principles is completely a hoax for the Philippines, has been completely economic dependent on its former colonists. Aside from that, with neocolonialism, therefore, the former colonists had created a spending tower so as far for its colonial subjects, be its consumers and buyers. As Philippine society advanced, so did the transnationalization of the Philippine economy. With the U.S. grand design of assimilating its capitalist and selfish pursuit into the system with its flagship of generous domination, it institutionalized International Monetary Fund, World Bank, and Asian Development Bank in Asia as trick of helping its former colonies. had to continuously borrow money from these parasitic institutions for domestic economic sustenance. But loaning money from these institutions skimmed conditions that resulted in lessening the Philippine currency and subsequently affecting the country's purchasing power. Hence, it resulted to cheaper raw materials, which subsequently resulted to abuse of natural resources. And in order to ease the inanition, the Marcus regime adopted labor export policy in 1974. And this adaptation signaled the institutionalization of OFW as the mover of the Philippine economy. But such state sponsorship was a typical labor export of male 
workers, particularly in the Middle East. The office of Cory Aquino after the 1986 EDSA revolution marked a shift in Filipino labor migration pattern, allowing females to work abroad as entertainers and domestic helpers. As Filipinas grew in number, so the number of cases of exploitation domestically and abroad. Domestically, due to increasing number of victims of illegal recruiters, and abroad, due to increasing number of abuses and even death. It is in this context, in 1987, that Tita Cory glorified the OFW as the bagong bayani in her speech in St. Margaret's Church in Hong Kong by saying these words. Nasa inyo ang lahat ng dahilan upang taas noon ninyong ipagmalaki ang inyong gawain. Ano man ang inyong gawain, gaano man ito kahamak sa paningin ng iba. Tandaan lamang ninyo na dakila ang lahat ng hanap buhay. Tandaan ninyo na hindi lamang ang inyong mga kabiyak, mga anak, mga kamag-anak ang magpapasalamat sa sakripisyo na inyong dinaranas kundi ang buong sambayan ng Pilipino. Kayo ay makasisiguro na ang inyong pamahalaan ay gagawin ang lahat para sa inyong ikabubuti. And through this, OFWs as bagong bayani. This heroic discourse legitimized and normalized the risk of migrating for work abroad. This bagong bayani discourse had not changed since then for no president since Marcos had ever attempted to change the course and path of maneuvering state-sponsored policies and programs. This neocolonial-sponsored discourse legitimized and normalized the exploitation of OFW by the ruling class, the first world countries in which the state had been milking by relegating them to the back burner and being free to foreign employers. The Philippines, despite the steady inflow of wealth coming from remittances, suffers from a vicious economic chop that condemns people to immigrate or to emigrate in order to survive even as their exodus deprives home economies of the workforce that might make it possible for others to remain and too much to say the cycle of filipino diaspora that sustains the country's economic subjects are subjects that help to the shortage of human resource that could help the home country in various areas so that it will be unnecessary in the future to depend on overseas remittances. Aside from the above mentioned and besides the labor export sponsorship of the Philippine government, working abroad had been part of its educational system through its promotion of globalization and global competitiveness to its citizens. Education in the Philippines has been controlled by colonial and neo-colonial powers. Actually, when Americans bought the Philippines from Spaniards, they had recognized the necessity of education in compelling the natives into submissions. And uh, as to further strengthen its mission, they established the normal school to train the natives to be its prime agents of pedagogic submission. And they started to send distinguished scholars known as pensionados to study abroad. So these two strategies had double barrel effects. The latter, after returning home, were given key positions expecting them to safeguard and sell colonial policies. And the first one, on the other hand, were expected to put into captivity the minds of the grassroots natives grassroots natives in racial ascent and submission, making the Filipinos as good colonial citizen of American empire, which made Filipino saints, lives, and consumes the American way, for they had internalized through its hidden curriculum and pedagogy that the good life is to be like Americans. And even in our um, program, even in the Cato Child program being implemented, Having the promotion of global uh, competitiveness is the hidden curriculum 
of producing future students in service of the first world countries. We can also view it as a response to the growing need for internalization in terms of producing a competent workforce to be a par with the rest of the world. Actually, lahat po tayo as we go on to formal education is being tricked with the institution's hidden curriculum. Well, yun talaga yung nangyayari. So, after discussing the specific objectives of this paper, we are uh, now in the position to address its last objective. Uh, at the beginning of the paper, the researchers explored the following points, the discussion of the ideological state of practice in Filipino diaspora and its implication to Philippine education. And these two points are designed to investigate how the concept of state apparatuses, particularly that of ideological state apparatus, explain why Filipino workers continue to pursue careers abroad despite the danger of being exploited by foreign em employers. And answering those, on the following conclusion. First, that the country is economically dependent on the remittances of overseas Filipino workers. Then the ruling class determines the ideo ideologies that are being transmitted through the ideological state apparatuses in the Philippines. Because the Filipino diaspora sustains the Philippine economy, the prevailing ideology that operates in the dominant ISA, which is the educational system, manipulates students into believing that becoming an overseas Filipino worker is the most indisputable way to be successful. And the means and relations of production in the contemporary Philippines are being controlled by the neo-imperial beast that are the developed nations as they take advantage of the transnationalization efforts of the Philippine government. Then, of course, I recommend that in order to put an end to this cycle of oppression, the educational system should be free and independent of any ideologies of the Western colonial domination. Aside from that, the educational system should inspire nationalism among pupils and students and teach them to embody their own culture and history. That Philippine education must be a Filipino education and the state must step up and commit the educational system to one that is based on the needs of the nation and its citizens and not the needs of the neo-imperialist beast. Filipinos must be encouraged to be educated for social change that aspires nationalist progress and the government should do so while offering plenty of opportunities for genuine individual progress. Again, Maria Elena Broza, thank you and God bless.